I'm around. All right, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the...
and I have the honor and privilege of kind of taking the helm for the first time, so uh, bear with me. We may have a few bumps along the way. We'll try to get through this in a timely manner. We, we kind of want to make sure that we get out of here, kind of set a, an hour time limit. We want full discussion, uh, but keep in mind that there are other committees and other things happening, so we want to try to move on uh, as fast as we can and address the issues that we have. I want to uh, point out a couple of things and recognize a few folks. For those of you who do not know, Holly Ogden is my assistant, so uh, Holly will be uh, helping me in this committee. Mike Harper here, uh, attorney from over in Tallahassee, uh, is, uh, does some legal work for the committee and gives analysis and goes through those, so certainly we appreciate your help, Mike. And then I'm honored to have uh, Senator Gavan as my XO, right? Uh, the next in the next in command. So uh, thank you for your willingness to serve there. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we've got uh, several new members on the committee, and I'm I welcome you, uh, Senator Carnley, Senator Bell, Senator Weaver, Senator Elliott. So thank you all for being here, and I think the other uh, members of the Judiciary Committee would agree that I think this is uh, the best committee out there. Uh, no offense to my my budget chairs or anybody else, but uh, anyway, great committee. You, you didn't say most powerful, you just said the best. Best, that's exactly right. So uh, with that being said, uh, let's see if we've got a quorum. Senator Albritton? Here. Senator Bell? Here. Senator Carnley? Here. Senator Coleman-Madison? Senator Elliott? Here. Senator Figures? Here. Senator Gavan? Here. Senator Orr? Senator Singleton, Here. Senator Smitherman, Here. Senator Stutz, Here. Senator Weaver, Here. and Senator Barfoot. Here. 13, we have a quorum. So we have a quorum. Let's get on to business. Uh, Holly, if you'll call the first bill. Senate Bill 1 by Senator Weaver. All right, Senator Weaver, let's hear about your bill. Thank you for the recognition, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be here with you at the Judy Committee. So most of you have, have heard my story by now, I'm, I'm pretty sure. On, on June 29th, 2022, Deputy Brad Johnson and Deputy Chris Poole were both shot in the head very near my home, almost at the foot of my driveway, which is my reason for beginning to, to look at this um, subject. And thankfully, Deputy Poole survived and he's able to be here with us today. But Deputy Johnson was killed by a man that was released early on good time. I always like to put a name with a face. This is this is Deputy Brad Johnson, my constituent who was murdered essentially at, at the foot of, of my driveway with his children. So the person that killed Deputy Johnson had been released on good time. His killer should have been behind bars. He'd escaped from DOC custody and he was still earning good time. This is unacceptable. Since that time, I've been working with a lot of law enforcement officials and agencies around the state trying to figure out that what we as a state can do better to tighten up our lenient good time laws. During this process, I learned that Alabama has the weakest good time laws in the country. We rank number 50 among all states. We are dead last. Our laws are two and a half times more lenient than California. They're five and a half times more lenient than the rest of the country, and this bill's aimed at solving the problem in two main ways. First, it reduces the amount of good time an inmate can receive. And second, this bill prohibits an inmate from earning good time if he or she has committed a serious violation while in DOC custody, like escape in the case of Deputy Brad Johnson. I hope that you all will support me in passing this important bill, and I'm open to questions. Thanks, Senator Weaver. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Senator Smith. I, uh, I really have a comment, and I will have a question afterwards. Uh, I've, Senator, I've been contacted by people in DO, Department of Correction, DOC, that's what it is, in DOC. And uh, let me bag out of that statement first and say this to you. I, I think under the, the circumstances that you said about that particular individual who had escaped, and quote, you know, I'm just quoting you, uh, 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 and said that he was still receiving credit for good time. 
I I think that that should be corrected. Let me say that first, just like we did on Niles Law, if you remember. But I, I but I think that this bill is going considerably overboard to address an individual problem that we need to look at and correct like we did on the Niles Law. I, I say that now I go back to the Department of Corrections. Let, let me say this. The, the, the conversation that was had with me, and I didn't initiate the conversation, is simply this, is that you getting ready to have the, the, the largest uprising that you've ever had when, when you, because this is used to control discipline. It's used to control their behavior in there. And when you got somebody sitting up in there that's got 25 years and you saying that you're going to stay here, well, I'm just using this as being general, 25 years, they ain't got nothing to lose and they ain't got nothing why they ought to be doing the things that they got them to do in there. That's number one. Number two is that we, we have a considerably shortage of correctional officers. We have a considerably shorter shortness of 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 applicants who are applying for this job. We as a body, we we got, and I'm just I'm just throwing a figure out there. I, I got it in my office, but we got hundreds of millions of dollars surplus in our germ fund, and yet we are not paying the kind of salaries these people have to have to attract to get people in there. We refuse to, to provide funds for our needs because we want to do what our wishes are. Let's go create a new project over there. You know, you take, for instance, we're talking about, I'm just going to show you a clear example. We can't find money to do that, but we can find $300 million to get the prison folks to keep on working that's over the bid and amount that we agreed upon. See, we we are not taking care of our needs for for taking care of, 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 of a whole lot of other things. And in this situation, that's what you have. You have a situation in here where where we're going to create a, an excessive danger. The second thing is that we 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 can't at this process. What's going to end up happening? is that because you're going to give somebody that's got low-level offenses uh, and keep them in jail, then you're going to end up to a point, and we were in this particular situation before, where you ain't going to have no jail to put the folks out there who murdering folks. I know that's an extreme example. I'm what you're going to do. We're going to have backlog. Folks ain't going nowhere. The folks that should be able to come out here and rehab and do what they got to do, they're not going anywhere. And and in closing, I'm gonna say this: is that we the 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 you can you. It was kind of like the way people were complaining about the folks getting the six months. I think that's maybe an executive thing that the governor had. I, I stand corrected if it wasn't, but the six okay the six months. But six months after the time they're complaining, they're going to be out. That's the whole point I'm making. Even this guy you're talking about here, and I, you know, I feel for the family and those people there, but okay, so he got out early, and when he gets out, he's going to be out. And if, and if he's out and he has the potential to be that kind of person, he's going to be it. So this is not going to stop what happened. I want everybody to understand that. It just it may delay it. If you got that kind of person, it's not going to stop their behavior. And so yet we're going to bag up, bag up. We're going to put these people who work in there in serious danger. And we're going to feel good by uh, bagging everybody else up in there. Even the people, all these other people, you got trustees, you got people who, who went out there, and I just picked this as an example, took somebody a lawnmower, you know, and so now, well, if they if they got a, a, a one to ten years, and and their centers based on a good time, the number of years that they're gonna go, because judges do that, by the way. If they want to keep them in there a certain time of, 
or, or, or in prison, they know about the good times. So if, if they want to keep him in that three years, they'll send him some for – I just picked it out for seven years, and they're going to spend three and a half years in there. So the But it allows the person that should be in the categories that we're talking about, like these trustees and things, to be able to operate and to be able to make room for these people who are in jail. So – I, you know, that's, I see that as a, a, a serious drawback on us in our penal system, uh, and uh, that's what the difficulties I have with the bill. Thank you. Senator Singleton. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I will, first of all, I will say, uh, Senator Weaver, thank you, uh, and I understand your concern of where you are with this bill, and loss of life is a loss of life, and, but at the end of the day, uh, we have security guards that get killed inside of our prison facility. We never came out, named a bill, or even made any adjustments to try to correct whatever's going on inside the prison system. And I think that we need to do something about this whole escape piece and having this good time out. But I just want to say that while we're under the scope of the federal government right now for overcrowdedness, on a 10-year sentence, your bill would keep a person in jail another 865 days longer. That's over two years longer. And so I don't know what that effects would have on what the federal government is looking at us in terms of overcrowding this because we're not moving people on parole. If the parole was, if we were paroling a lot of people, then the parole would go out and the good time numbers would go down. But the good time numbers goes up because there's no parolees going out. So they're going to have to go one way or the other because people are going to earn it because they're not being released. So we either got to get our parole system together and parole people that, that need to be out in or we talk about disincentive. The disincentive is not given. As Senator Smith said, I could see some riots happening inside of our prison system, because this is some one of the only tools that DOC have at some point in time to deal with these inmates, to get them to go to classes, to get them to go into SAP program, to get them to go into other programs where they know they're going to get credit. But if they're sitting around, we can't work them. If they're sitting around doing nothing and feel like I'm not going to get credit for doing anything, so I might as well do something criminal sitting on my bunk today. Go commit me another assault. And so I just think that we are holding people in the prison much longer. I think the unintended consequences of this bill, why it's emotional, and I understand where we're going with it, but, and we do need to correct. I think some of, uh, if you look in, in this bill, it talks about riots, some of the things that are happening on the inside of the prison, if they escape or if there's a riot. I don't want to stop a person for ability to be able to protest. And not that be able to look as a riot because the First Amendment doesn't go away that if something is going on wrong and they want to protest. And I think a lot of this need to be cleaned up. I have a substitute. And I have not given you an opportunity to read it. And I told you I would. So I'm not going to offer it here. OK, but what it does is it, it splits the baby with where you're going. While on a 10 year sentence, while you want to take for every 30 days and make it 30, I'm saying to make the 30 and make it instead of 75, make it 60 where you was. A person will spend another 800 uh, days in prison with yours. They will probably spend another 215 days under my theory, okay? So I'm willing to split it. But I'm going to give this to you, so I'm going to offer this as a floor amendment once we come on on the floor because I told you I will allow you to do it, and I don't want to blindside you this morning with this, and no one has read it. And so I'm not going to offer it now, but I just want to talk about it just a little bit and what it's doing. But I think the unintended consequences of this bill is going to bag our system up. Not only just what's going on inside the prison, but let's look back at the court, at, at the pretrial sentencing, when, when someone want a plea, and good time is usually offered in those pleas. Well, if good time is not offered, if I can't get good time, I might as well take my chance to go to trial. What does that do? Bag up the trial docket. More and more and more. And that's when now we got to get more judges. We got to find more judges to be able to get some of these cases out. And so it has a a lingering effect across the system. And I th hope that y'all will wonder, think about this. Let's slow this down. I think we can get it right. It's no rush for this at this point in time. It's not going to bring uh, Mr. Johnson back 
while I sympathize with he and his family, let's get it right to make sure that we don't, we're not just letting those criminals out that need to be, but we need to reward people who are being good, who wants to get out and come out and, and do something else differently with their lives. So we need to do that. So I, 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 I yield my time back to the chairman, but I want to give you this to let you know so you can look over it and we'll discuss it later. Senator Coleman Madison, I think you had a, a comment or a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Weaver, thank you. And I read your bill, and of course we've talked uh, you know, about the situation that happened, and we've talked about some personal things in my own life. So I see things on both sides of the spectrum and been impacted on both sides. Unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world, and, and it's, it, it's sad, especially with the state of affairs right now, and we see all these things happening. But I want to just to imagine everybody, what if there is no good time? Just imagine what goes on inside those walls. There is no good time. I don't have, you know, and I may be in there for a long time, and so what incentive is there for me to behave, to try to do right? Uh, we have a problem right now with our correction system, and again, we don't live in a perfect world. I wish we could unring that bell. In your case and mine as well, but we don't. So if this bill, just asking you, if this bill were already passed and in place, would it have prevented mm -hmm. that from happening? I would say if, if this bill had been in place, the person who shot Deputy Johnson, and I won't even say his name because I don't think he deserves the credit for that, but um, he would have still been in jail on the day that Deputy Johnson was shot. Okay. Do you know the reason why, obviously there was something that happened prior to, and when this guy got out, he had, that was a desire for him, you know, to commit this crime. And regardless of whether he got out two years or three years, and he had more time to sit there, and it festered, and he thought about it, and he got angry, and when he got out, he committed that crime. So had this bill passed, as Senator Smithland said, it wouldn't have prevented it from happening based on, because from what you explained to me, there was no altercation where he came up that you did something to me right now or you did something to me yesterday. This was something that happened in the past, and I don't know what that was. It would not have helped that. The other thing is looking at the fiscal note, which states that it is estimated that our housing for inmates is approximately $80 a day. Um, so we're not going to have any good time. We're just going to keep these people in. We better get ready to add more money to the budget because we're going to have more people that are there. Uh, eventually, they will get out one day. Eventually, they will get out one day. And um, you're going to have a whole lot of angry people out here in this imperfect world already that we have. From somebody that's on both sides of this issue, lived it, know it, I'm hoping that we can come to a better resolution by sitting down and working together on it to make it better, that it's going to be effective. Thank you. So I, I would say to that, I, I've been working on this bill for nine months now. I could have had a child by now. It, it's no surprise that I've been working on this issue, and I actually have an amendment that I'm going to bring um, that outlines all the issues that people that I have sat down with have asked me to help them work through. And so um, at the appropriate time, I would like to offer that amendment. And let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and I came uh, to each one of you and ask you and it, you had the opportunity to come to me. Let's go ahead and take that amendment. If you will pass that out. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> Told me after you'd already done the B one. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a motion um, to adopt the amendment. We're going to look at it. We'll talk about it. But is that your motion? Yes, it is. All right. But it's a minute. Yeah, we're going. We're going. We're on the we'll amendment. We'll it. have. I'll, I'll talk through. Have it. Senator Weaver explain that. Okay. Okay. So the 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 two A amendment is a grammar change from LSA changing either to any. I'm replacing lines 130 through 131 on page five. Could 
May I ask a question? Why did LS say they used to put the page number first and then the lines? And now they're putting the lines and saying on page. Yeah, and I think because my explanation is Oh, no, I understand that, but it's just that you need a reference first, like you're following directions. You need a page first, but they say a line first, and then you have to read to see what page number it is. And I'm just wondering, what is the mindset behind yeah, that? Yeah, good question. I don't know. That's an LSA question. I suspect yeah. all of us are trying to get, I think, comfortable with the new system, and I'm not sure any of us are there yet, but we'll, we'll work through it. Senator Weaver. Happy to. Yes, sir. So that one is a grammatical error. And then the second one on replacing line 138 on page 5 with the following under age of 17 years, number 3, he or she has been convicted of a Class B felony that is a violent offense. So that only adds violent Class Bs. Then on page 151, page 6 with the following existing law or we changed depart prison to department to match the other language throughout the bill. On line 158 on page 6, um, that commits or attempts to commit an overt act toward the commission in any of the following violations is from the criminal code, so they added that in to, to match on page 173 on page 7, that G1 ad for prisoners receiving correctional incentive time, the term of supervision required pursuant to that section shall not further reduce the term of imprisonment except where minimum required term of supervision would exceed the correctional incentive time accrued. That part just says that the supervision becomes after the term of imprisonment already serving doesn't reduce the sentence. So no double dip in there on page 180 on page 7, that changes the numbers so that they match up with the 2 and the 3 under G1. And then adding the, the line at the end is language just to show that this is now the rule that they will go by. And it does not change any DOC rules at all. It, it, the adoption of the 403 um, DOC rules would still be in place and we would go by what they have as their administrative rule as of the August of 2020. So that is um, that is what that amendment does. Okay, so we're on the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have Weaver. a question of the sponsor. Senator Weaver, you submitting this bill, does it only have to do with inmates who have committed violent crimes, or is this for all inmates? This would apply so this to would all inmates. This would only be for the very small percentage of people who are eligible for good time. So out of the prison population. No, 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 but those people who are, what if they went in for drug, drug charges or... or some, uh, it does not change change the thought behind how we give good time. It o it's a math issue. It only changes the but way it can that it's extend. calculated. Right. Okay. Because I I too with Senator Coleman Madison have been on both sides as well. But um, okay. Certainly, we're not changing the thought process behind behind how good time is earned. It's the calculation, and except for the instances of these offenses that are outlined as well. I know, but I think with, with all of the problems that we are having in DOC that range from, I mean, just small things to terribly big things, that we should take our time with this before we change something so extensively because, I don't know, I, I can't even imagine being in prison myself, but I do know if I was there and I was trying to get out and good time was a way to do that. <coughs> I wouldn't want that taken from me. And in so many instances, there are inmates in there who are trying to do the good time, but then there are other inmates who will instigate something that will cause them to, to, to get involved in something that will take away from that already. Um, 
I, I just think I would like for you to at least hold it up and get with all of the parties and all of this that has been saying, because if it's going to have that trickle down effect of these unintended consequences from the court systems on, I think we need to take our time before we just push it. And I understand what you're saying, and 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 my heart goes out to, to Mr. Johnson's family. Um, but I think we need to take our time with this so that you will definitely affect what you're trying to do. Because you, you can't, you, you really can't, and I know a lot of things happen to different people, and then they want us to change a law that wouldn't have had anything to do or stopped or whatever. Because we don't know, first of all, we don't know what God's will is. And, you know, to, we cannot predict what any human is going to do. And just because one did it doesn't mean that others would do it. So that's why I really want us to take our time and look at every, every angle and every um, concern with this before we push it forward. I Thank guess my comment to that would be, if, if I may. And go, you've go had ahead. nine months with it, but we haven't. <laughs> right. Um, I guess my comment to that would be, I understand your concerns, but I also have great concerns for the law enforcement in all of our communities. Oh, I do too. Last last year we were here naming a bill after Nick Reisner. To, this year we're naming it after Brad Johnson. It happened in my community. God forbid it happens in anybody else's community. But I worry about the safety of our law enforcement officers who continue to deal with all of these issues as these people who continue these uh, to have these offenses get out on good time. So that's my reason and my my interest, and in I think we owe it all to, to our law enforcement officers to continue with this process. Oh, I am the greatest supporter of law enforcement and the protection of them because I know that, I mean, I'm the one who stood with them. I'm one of the ones who stood with them during the gun bills that have come before us and their protection when they begged us. And exactly. you are yeah. the majority still passed that bill, which put them <laughs> in more jeopardy <laughs> with these guns, <laughs> which he was shot in the guns. head. So, I mean... <laughs> Anyway, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you, right. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Figures. Uh, we're on the amendment still. Uh, Senator Smith, like did you have a comment on the amendment? amendment. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Senator Figures, I'm glad that you said that because, you know, and I'm glad, you know, I see the media and the people here there because I, I, I want to reiterate what you just said. You know, don't be paying no picture that we don't care about law enforcement and, 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 and that's the, you know, champion for law enforcement. No. We were the ones trying to protect them on these stops, okay, so with these guns and these kids and, and, and people. So, that you know, I just want to correct that. And I want to make another correction. I thank the body for allowing me to serve in the capacity that I have, but uh, serving as president pro tem and serving as chairman of judiciary for 10 years, you never lost your guns. You never lost your rights. So, you know, don't put this on no party thing. I, you know, let's clear that up. Let's get away from that. Let's deal with these issues. And what I was going to say was this, was, was, was number one, we should deal with the people who do what we talk about being done. That guy needs to be locked up from now and forever in 10 days who did that. Let me say that first. But, but we, can, we cannot be like a horse running down the race with blinders on and I sell airplane with blinders on, and here's wings, and, and you don't see these wings, and everything that these wings hit is going to destroy. That's what we are dealing with here. We're trying to fly an airplane down on this issue, not realizing there's wings on this plane. And all these things you hear people talking about are the things that the wings are going to hit and destroy while we are trying to focus on this, you know, this emotional thing or this situation right here. When we start talking about deaths, I was standing up yesterday. I was at a meeting yesterday. When you all saw the alpha ties, I was there. And Representative Chris England down in the House reiterated that there was over 250 inmates who were murdered in our penal system this year or within the last year in the system. Hmm. Okay? We ain't talking about none of this inside the system. He, Senator Singer was talking about guards. I'm talking about inmates who are just as innocent as could be. The person who is the paralegal for the firm that's next to what my office, her son like is in prison, and he was almost killed. Okay, he was almost killed. He's in the infirmary right now, and that's simply because they what he was just saying. They sitting up in there, 
And it's the second time that they have jumped on him, you know. And the first thing that was getting ready to happen is that they found, you know, I'm sure that they they, they found some reason why he ought to be thrown into the mix. And in essence, what this guy was doing, he's trying to defend himself from getting killed. He didn't initiate nothing. But this bill saying that if you ever ride or you start something like that, then all y'all going to be thrown into this pot to deal with this. That's not right. That's not right at all. That's not right at all. And and so I'm saying that, yeah, you're right that it needs to be done that way. And, yes, you you are right what you said about the bill. Yes, the senator walked up to me and, and told me about the bill and said, you got some comment. Comments? You know, it's something nine months, and you get, and I got nine minutes, and I got to make a comment, you know, and decide whether this ought to be legitimate. No. You know, if people look strange at us sometime when we on the floor. You know, we have that the first impression we've seen of stuff. I ain't talking about a comment that I'm doing this, but the first is to sit down and let's go through each step, step by step. You know, that's all that I'm saying. That'd be the first impression. So f- for us, it, what is it? It's committed as a whole because we are not on certain committees and, and things are thrown out there after the fact that they have been put together, you know, and, and analyzed. And that's the third thing I want to say. I'm going to be through, Mr. Chairman. That that's why you have to have diversity. You got to have us and other people sitting at the table with you to be able to share these other angles and things that 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 you got to put into the mix. It's like making a cake. You don't have no lemon flavoring. Your cake ain't gonna taste worth nothing. You got to have it all in there. And so yes, you know. And and I know this ain't the platform, but I'm gonna say it like this. You know, you heard what I just said about the need for diversity. I mean, we down here now, we got folks in the house who want, don't want us to even be at the table. It's bills. Now, yeah, I'm just saying, this, you know, so that's what concerns me, even here, that we're not taking any of that under consideration. None of that whatsoever. We just going to wipe out the whole situation, just like we were saying about the inmates. So I just got a concern. Thank Thank you. Thanks, Senator. You had to bring up that you were uh, the chairman of this committee, which means that, you know, I'm going to pale in comparison. I I wish you wouldn't have done that. So uh, (laughs) big shoes to fill. So uh, we're on the amendment. You've offered the amendment. Uh, I'll second that amendment. I have one question I want to ask. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Uh, Did you consult uh, DOC and or the governor's office since she the governor had an executive order out there on good time? So after the executive order, I gave the governor's office this bill for their review the day that I filed it. Um, I have had my door open for DOC. I have had three or four um, very, very in-depth discussions with DOC in my office, and my door has been open for discussion. And what did they say, if you can share that? So um, the last thing that, that, I mean, I had a meeting with the commissioner, and Mr. Williams and, and Dion, and the only thing that they brought to my attention was that there might be an issue with reporting because their current... Um, software wouldn't potentially allow everything to be reported in the form that we were asking them. And I, I made that agreement with them that I would listen to anything they said about reporting, and we're still working through some of that stuff. But um, reporting was the only thing that they brought up to me. So did they tell you they... So I will tell they, you... I'm off just asking, okay. did they say they just support and adopt this bill? I did don't they tell you that? put words in their mouth. Well, I was they asking did not you. say that. No. Okay, okay. No, they did all. not say they supported it. Let me be very clear. Okay. And I got some, some language in an email very late Friday afternoon that had some more suggestions, and I will tell you it came from somebody that I'm not familiar with, but I assume they're related to DOC, related to numbers. Um, but the only thing that I talked to them in person about in my office was reporting. All right. Um, now we're on the amendment. You've offered it. I've seconded it. Uh, let's take a vote on that. Holly, if you call the roll. Senator Albritton. Aye. Senator Bell. Aye. Senator Carnley. Aye. Senator Coleman Madison. Senator Elliott. Aye. Senator Figures. I'll be consistent with the no. Senator Gavan. Senator Orr? Aye. Senator Singleton? No. Senator Smitherman? No. Senator Stutz? Aye. Senator Weaver? Aye. Senator Barfoot? Aye. Okay, 9-3-1. 
All right. Uh, amendment is adopted. I think, Senator Bell, you had um, a question or comment about uh, the bill itself now is amended. I guess I look at this bill a little bit different. Um, if you get a 10-year sentence, judge goes into court, gives you a 10-year sentence, the person's sentence knows what they're getting roughly if good time is figured. Um, I've represented multiple people, been on both sides of the aisle. And so you know you're going to do three, three and a half years if you get a 10-year sentence. But if you go down there, act right, do the things you're supposed to do, that's when you're going to get out. But if you go down there and try to escape, you're peddling drugs, you're assaulting officers, you're assaulting other inmates, what are you going to do if you continue getting your good time? What are you going to do when you get out? You're going to continue the same behavior that you did in prison when you get out. There's, there's no consequences to being bad in prison. And therefore, then my family or other families are in jeopardy of being hurt or being harmed. It's more of a safety issue from the people that are going to continue being bad, whether they're locked up or out in the public. And that's why I support the bill is they're going to continue getting in trouble when they get out. And the longer we can keep them behind bars, the safer our families are. Thank you. Good comments. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Senator Albritton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Weaver, I'm going to vote for your bill. All right. I, I, I'm of the philosophy that, yes, bad people need to be behind bars. Uh, our first duty is protecting the public. But there are lots of concerns here that I have, and it's uh, concerning money, and it's concerning the practicality of where we're going to put them. We haven't built a prison in 50 years in Alabama. We have closed several. The number of available space of beds, if you will, is declining. We don't have room for people. Um, in most of our prisons, we have the dormitories, which has 100 minimum, 150 sometimes, in one area, in a dormitory. Hence, we have the issues that's going on. Uh, yes, we need to lock them up. But when we don't have locks, we don't have cells, we don't have doors, we don't have guards, uh, where will they wind up being? Where are they going to be? Where do we keep them? How do we protect the public in that way, in that fashion? I have an amendment I've given to you earlier on. I support the bill, but I would like for this effective date to be delayed. Not delayed till we get new prisons built. I don't know exactly how long that's going to take, and that will th be two or three years. But at least until we find a means to where we can have some additional space, space I'm determining to be beds. So what I'm, my amendment does, and I'll read this for the body for just a moment. The pertinent part is that... Uh, Uh, let's see, when the Department of Corrections certifies bed space is available. And it continues in that. By the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections to the Governor, Speaker of the House, and Representatives, and Pro Tem, that it has the necessary bed space available to implement this act. When we have the room, we can take it. Now, um, Mr. Bennett Wright is here, uh, and, and if the Chair would like, he, I'm sure he'd be able to come forward and give some... Uh, expert information as to how this may or shall affect uh, the prisons and the spaces that we have, if that's meanable. I have the utmost respect for Mr. Wright, and through this process, I've been engaged with him, had multiple discussions with him, um, and, uh, and I know Senator Weaver has as well, um, um, and he is... Uh, he certainly has the intellect and ability and ex expertise in this. And so uh, I, I don't have a problem if you want to ask him to come up and answer any questions that you may have. I'm certainly satisfied with the bill in its amended format as it is. Um, if you'd like to have him come up and discuss your amendment, that would be okay. Well, I would you suggest don't mind, there's just forbearance to find out if this is actually a valid amendment or not, whether it would have an effect. Well, I don't have a problem with that. My, my issue is, and of course, you know, 
I think this is a committee that we need to have open dialogue and discussion about with the time constraints, though, there are five other bills. Senator Orr's got some folks here with uh, from out of town. I'll leave that to your discretion, understanding that, you know, we've got several other bills on here that we need to discuss. Senator Orr's mad at me already. Um, <laughs> Mr. Bennett, well, uh, would you mind uh, coming forward? <laughs> time constraints. Yes, sir. Will this uh, uh, Senator Weaver's bill, will that affect... Uh, overcrowding or affect prisoner retention in prisons? I'll give you the short answer. It's complicated, but it very well could um, to, to really the extent that it would exacerbate prison crowding would rely on multiple assumptions. Those assumptions would rely on what is the judicial reaction to the change in the law with good time and paroling practices. Would my amendment help alleviate some of that, those propensities? It would definitely allow additional time for study and review to see what the potential ramifications of that would be in terms of we talking about a bed space extra of 10 or an extra bed space of 1500 it could it could run the gamut it, it could that's that's why I've kept it simply to to an additional bed space yes sir All right if, let me if I could before I recognize you senator figures let me just make a comment or uh, oh, uh, after him. After okay let me uh, the philosophy now is is that good time is given on the front end and an inmate can lose that. So, for an example, under current law, a 10-year sentence, an inmate could lose that good time and could spend up to 10 years on that sentence, for instance, correct? That is correct. And so this would not necessarily mean the implementation of the amended bill that she has, that Senator Weaver has, it would not mean... Uh, that for sure that inmates stay in there longer than they currently could be in, uh, in, in custody now for. Is that a correct statement? It, it would definitely require people spend additional time in prison. Requires. It would. It, yes. Well, yeah. it, no, it would require, tell me if I'm wrong or right, it would require the potential that they spend additional time. But the population now could not get, could uh, uh, lose good time now and not receive that good time, and on a 10-year sentence could be locked up under today's law for up to 10 years if they lost good time and didn't receive it. Is that an accurate statement? That's an accurate statement. Their, their, their parole dates would actually be pushed further back, so their first bite at the apple at, at the parole hearing would be pushed further back. So their minimum time to serve would increase. But it's also true that under today's standards, right or wrong, in which I may wind up uh, agreeing with Senator Smitherman about that those inmates are not getting paroled out now by and large. Is that a correct statement? That is correct. Okay. And secondly, just want to point out something. Good time only applies to inmates of 15 years or less. Yes. So um, so the easiest way to think about it is the converse. People that do not do not receive good time are inmates sentenced to death, life, life without parole, Class A felonies, any sentence in excess of 15 years, splits, a death involving a deadly weapon or instrument, and child sex offense. And the it's inmate population that is eligible for good time at this point is about 10 percent. Is that? And climbing. It's, it's approximately, it's about 26 to 2,700 of the 21,000 that are currently incarcerated. And your statement about uh, the potential changes from the judicial side of the equation which I support split sentences that allows judges to have more control or uh, allows judges to make sure they know what the inmates are doing. If that model switched from the judicial side, mm -hmm. then those split sentences would not be eligible now, nor are, are they, they're not eligible now for good time, nor would they be eligible in the future. And so correct. this bill would not adversely affect any of that population. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, Senator Figures, you had a, a, a question or comment? Yes. Uh, Senator Aubrey, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, we were in a meeting, I think, last week or week before last with uh, mental health dealing with Mobile and Baldwin counties, and they were asking for capital money. And when Senator Aubrey asked, well, he asked about training, which led into my question about staffing. Did this include that, too? because you can't build a, a building with beds unless you have the staff to take care of the people who are going to come there. So you're raising the same question here, basically, 
that even if we had the additional beds in the rooms, they're going to be staying there longer. It's already been noted that we're having a problem trying to hire people uh, into the system anyway. So, and, and that is why I said too, let's take our time to make sure what we're doing and that we take the time to see exactly what the consequences are going to be and ramifications are going to be down the line so that you don't get in there and then you, you can't really be effective with what you're actually trying to do. And, and Senator, if I may, I'm not trying to carry this over. I'm not I didn't say you were. All I just mentioned the do, money. Yes, ma'am. All I'm trying to do is delay the effect of this bill uh, for some time frame until DOC can find some additional space in which to cover the potential here. And as already been discussed, we're not talking about a whole lot of people necessarily. Uh, the small percentage is there. Uh, so I'm... I'm uh, I'm asking for a little bit of delay, and at that point, I would move to adopt my amendment and ask you, for a You've offered that amendment. Um, Senator Weaver, you want to speak on that? I would say that in the essence of times, we're still in the first bill, and we're 45 minutes into it. So, wow. So I would, you know, I just got this amendment as I was coming in the door. I, I haven't had time to, to look at it. Um, I would like to discuss it more with you before we... I would love to it. discuss it. Um, Senator, would you... Off, can, offline, uh, would you, between here and now. Would you consider uh, delaying uh, uh, a vote on your amendment to have some opportunity to discuss with Senator Weaver? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll follow the lead of the chair, as always, but I would like to get a vote to find out where I am on this. Okay. okay. So you've got a, you've got a, uh, offered your amendment. Is there a second on I, Senator Albritton's second. amendment? I would ask that we table that amendment. Okay. There's a first and a second. We've got a, um, um, an, um, a motion to table the amendment. Um, let's take a vote on the motion to table, and then we'll come back on the amendment uh, should that fail. So we're on the motion to table. Senator Albritton? Motion to table, no. Senator Bell? Aye. Senator Cornley? Aye. Senator Coleman Madison? No. Senator Elliott? Aye. Senator Figures? No. Senator Gavan? Aye. Senator Orr? Aye. Senator Singleton? No. Senator Smitherman? No. Senator Stutz? Aye. Senator Weaver? Aye. Senator Barfoot? Aye. Eight and five. All right. Uh, motion table uh, is. I uh, thank you. Thank the chair for his consideration. I'm sorry I've made other people other than Senator Orr mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So we're back on the bill. Uh, you, uh, as amended by Senator Weaver, you've offered that. I've second that. Uh, without any discussion, any more discussion, let's take a vote on that bill. Senator Albritton? Aye. Senator Bell? Aye. Senator Cornley? Aye. Senator Coleman Madison? Aye. Senator Elliott? Aye. Senator Figures? No. Sorry, I was drinking coffee. Senator Gavan? Aye. Senator Orr? Aye. Senator Singleton? No. Senator Smitherman? No. Senator Stutz? Aye. Senator Weaver? Aye. Senator Barfoot? Uh, aye. Nine and four. All right, the bill is given a favorable report. Uh, let's move on. Second uh, bill on the agenda, we're going to come back to this SB 39. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, Senator Orr, you have some uh, folks here that have come from out of town, so let's address your uh, SB 55. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and I do have uh, two amendments I'll pass around very quickly. Um, I'd like to call to the uh, microphone so he's ready, uh, Mr. James Tucker from ADAP. That's the Alabama, um, forget the, uh, what it stands for, but um, <laughs> you can help us, James. Yes, sir, I and, can. And uh, it's in Tuscaloosa. I know that much. That's right. And um, this bill briefly is, uh, has been passed in 18 other states. So this is not a bill of first impression as far as our sister states. It provides an area where if, you, if you've got highly competent individuals uh, and they're named as the adult in the bill, um, but they do have some um, mental, you know, they do have some mental uh, challenges, 
uh, it allows a mid-grade, a mid-grade between a going ahead and proceeding with a, a conservatorship or guardianship for their assets or for their person. Uh, you don't go that far, but it allows them some autonomy. A uh, question's been asked about powers of attorney. Why can't they just execute a power of attorney? Well, I think Mr. Tucker will tell you there been a lot of there has been a lot of abuse across the state where an individual may execute a power of attorney and then get the attorney in fact that take, it takes a lot of their assets and uh, some problems arise. I'm trying to move it along, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like Mr. Tucker to add any comments and then we can talk about the amendment. Sure, Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Senators. Uh, James Tucker with the Alabama Disabilities Advocacy Program, ADAP at the law school in Tuscaloosa. Basically, this bill would provide one additional alternative mechanism by which to allow individuals who are competent to retain their decision-making power and not have that power be taken away or then potentially abused by um, a power of attorney, guardianship, conservatorship, as Senator Orr said, it has been passed in 18 states. We think it's um, a useful alternative to guardianship in the state of Alabama and is a functional tool that should be available to individuals who would choose to exercise what's known as a supported decision-making arrangement. Thank you so motion much. Motion to adopt the amendment. Got uh, right, motion so to adopt. There are two amendments. There are two. So let's say amendment number one is the one with the form that would be embedded into the um, into the bill, and it doesn't have to be this exact form. We wanted to get kind of the highlights and the requirements. Uh, Mr. Latham uh, draft, drafted this and uh, is very supportive. Okay, so we're on amendment number one. You've so offered I'll second guys. the uh, motion by Senator Single. All right, um, uh, Senator Smitherman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, who is going to make the determination whether this person has the capability? to enter into this mid-range uh, agreement because to determine the conservatorship and the guardianship, you have to go to court. Senator, to I think it's that. a... Yes, let, sir. Let me, let me finish my yes, question. Sir. And in that court, competent witnesses, medical records, depositions from doctors, uh, along with a variety of other pieces of evidence are presented to the court. At that time, the court makes a determination whether this person is a non-compass menace or whether or not they can understand fully their decisions. Uh, things are brought in like uh, whether or not medical show that they're at the beginning phase of all harmers, whether or not the fact that you may, in, this, in a situation, if you allow them to go forward, whether or not the conditions that they were in were going to be... Uh, deteriorating kind of conditions, well, which we don't have a cure for, that's going to lead them to a point that they can't do that. Who makes that determination, number one, in this bill or about this level, and and what kind of uh, uh, safeguards are, it, are in place in this bill? I'm not talking about what's out there because that applies to the other, the conservatorship and guardianship. In this particular bill, what is it there that's going to address those issues I just mentioned? Yes, Senator, a couple of thoughts. First of all, this the, the mechanism provided in this bill is like a power of attorney in that it is an instrument entered into outside of court, if you will, like a private contract. However, it is different from a power of attorney in that it does not give rights to another person to make decisions about the integrity and decision maker of the adult entering into the de supported decision making uh, agreement. It's different from a guardianship and conservatorship as you indicate in that it does not require a court order. However, there is a protection in this bill such that if there is a concern regarding the execution or implementation of the supported decision-making agreement, then the probate court may review uh, the propriety and execution of the supported decision-making agreement. So as described at the top of the discussion, it provides an alternative to guardianship like power of attorney, 
but it's not nearly as intrusive as a guardianship or conservatorship. So the bottom line is that it preserves decision-making integrity to adults who are competent. Thank you for that. I, and for that question as well, because I had that, that similar question, and I'm, I'm supporting uh, the, the, the bill and the amendment. Um, if we could, let's get back on the amendment. There was a first and a second. I mean, a first. Mr. Mr. Sam. Yes, sir. Uh, I wouldn't. I had a follow-up. Oh, I'm sorry. Go saying. ahead. May I ask yes, sir. Go right ahead. Thank you. If this is a contract, because you've mentioned contract several times, and if the person who enters the contract deteriorates and becomes mentally mentally how in the world you're going to get out of the contract if if there's there has been no determination by the courts of whether they were competent or not to make that contract i mean because the person who who makes the contract if they if they you know if they deteriorate and uh, paranoid schizophrenia you know and want to you know understand what i'm coming from and yes, sir, they, do. they don't believe they're supposed to take the medicine you know that <laughs> Yes, sir. I uh, did. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's somebody who who is in, when they taking the medicine, they competent enough to talk about it and do this and everything else. But now they don't take it. How how is this contract gonna be void without a, that determination? I mean, you, you understand what I'm getting at? Now, I see. I just tell you, I honestly see in this. I know there are some people that don't want they. People, or they don't want to have to get to the point that they can't control what they have. But I also see this setting it up for some of the most serious abuse under contract law that somebody's got a right to do A, B, C, or D. In fact, I've seen one case that has a similarity to this where where the person was kind of competent, you know, and then all of a sudden they wasn't, and then they came in and took all these folk money. Okay, see, under the name that they signed this and knowing what they are doing, here's the contract. So I can see the room for a considerable amount of abuse. And I think the Alabama Law Institute is working on something related to this as, as we speak now. And I think that will be more of a, a, a thorough uh, follow through on this particular issue than all the abuses, unintended, of course, that this opens. And, I, and I'm through when I say this, Mr. Chairman. I keep saying this. It's just like on the last bill. We get all worked up about some emotional thing, and we don't see all these other things that's going to happen to everybody else that, that's in this once they move to that. There's no nothing in here that deals with that, you know. And 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 so I I I I, I have concerns about that aspect of it. Thank you, thank, Mr. thank you, Senator Smitherman. Um, let me. We're back on the uh, amendment uh, first and a second on the first amendment. Uh, let's call a roll on that. Senator Albritton, Aye. Senator Bell, Aye. Senator Cornley, Senator Coleman Madison, Senator Elliott, Aye. Senator Figures, Aye. Senator Gavan, Aye. Senator Orr, Aye. Senator Singleton. I guess I make a motion. Senator Smitherman? Aye. On the amendment. Senator Stutz? Okay. Senator Weaver? Aye. Senator Barfoot? Aye. Twelve. Uh, the amendment passes. Uh, Senator Coleman Madison, do you have a quick comment? Yes, sir, I did. I want to thank Senator Smitherman because he basically took it to where I was going, and I'm one of the biggest proponents of uh, an advocate for people with disabilities having done that in my professional life. And, and the question that I want to have, I don't, I'm a co-sponsor on this bill, but I want to know, is there a review again? I'm trying to get to where Senator Smitherman is going. At some point in time, is there an annual review or a person goes in to determine whether they are competent? Because, uh, you know, I believe that, that people with disabilities who can make that decision, you know, I believe in nothing about us without us. But if, if, if it's set up where there's no out, there's no review to determine, and I had a brother-in-law that was like that, and again, you're right, when he's on this medicine, he's doing fine. He could talk to you like PhD, but you let him get off. So 
Is there a, a, a point in here where there is some type of review to determine whether that person is still in that state of mind where they can make their own decisions? Senator, there's not a there's not a mechanism for a judicial determination. The decision making agreement mechanism would operate more like a power of attorney than like a court ordered guardianship or conservatorship. With regard to the questions that both you and the senator have asked, I would note that in the event of the deterioration of capacity of an individual, even if that individual had entered into a supported decision making agreement, they still would be subject, for example, to a guardianship or a conser conservatorship, or in the cases that you have described, um, in the case of a serious mental illness and deterioration, they potentially would be subject to an involuntary civil commitment. So all of the protections that exist in our state law for individuals who might be at risk of deterioration remain in full force and effect. This simply provides one state law recognized tool by which to protect decision-making authority, which you're referring to. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Did you have a follow-up question? I just coming? want to know, did you say how many other states use the same model? Approximately 18. I'd like to know how they're working. I, I can provide that information. Thank you. You've got uh, second. second Amendment. Yeah. Uh, second On the Second Amendment, uh, do you want to give a brief explanation? It's in front of you if you want to review it. Right. This just uh, requires that uh, you can't be forced uh, to into this, um, uh, into a, um, let's see, in, into in, an agreement to, to, to signing one of these agreements. Some, uh, some right, good. I, I like that amendment. Senator Smithland. Does, does the amendment go further than just forced, I mean, coerced, or by fraud, you know, by deceit, deception? Does, does that amendment mention all those things? I think those things are in the bill, are they not? They are in part, Senator. Uh, where? where? Can somebody tell me? I, I, that's I saw a, the I, amendment that Senator Orr refers to yesterday fully think that it is appropriate to amend to clarify that individuals should not be subject to imposition of such an agreement by a third party. Uh, share your concern and support the amendment. Senator can Smith, I, can I, I, let me just say this. I think you've got some valid concerns to make sure that we're doing what we need to do, what the intent is without adverse consequences. My request for Senator Orr and for you and for other members that may have any concerns about it if we could put this bill, if we could go ahead and take an up or down vote on it as amended if we get the Second Amendment on there, and then would you touch base with Senator Orr? Would you be willing I'll, to I'll do that? I'll touch base. Before, before it gets any movement on the floor? That, that'd be fine. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So uh, we've got a first on the second on the Second Amendment. Um, Holly, if you'll call the roll. Senator Albritton. Aye. Senator Bell. Aye. Senator Carnley. Aye. Senator Coleman-Madison. Senator Elliott? Aye. Senator Figures? Aye. Senior, Senator Gavan? Aye. Senator Orr? Aye. Senator Singleton? Aye. Senator Smitherman? Aye. Senator Stutz? Senator Weaver? Senator Barfoot? Aye. Oh, we got 12. All right, second committee uh, is amendment is adopted. Uh, no, we're on the bill. Um, if you would call the roll on the bill as amended in part. Senator Albritton? Aye. Senator Bell? Aye. Senator Carnley? Aye. Senator Coleman-Madison? Senator Elliott? Aye. Senator Figures? Aye. Senator Gavan? Aye. Senator Orr? Aye. Senator Singleton? Aye. Senator Smitherman? Aye. Senator Stutz? Senator Weaver? Senator Barfoot. Aye. 11 to 1. 11 to 1. Uh, bill's given a favorable report. Moving right along, SB 104, Senator Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, SB 104 deals with liability insurance for our restaurateurs, bars, retailers, et cetera. Um, it um, came to my attention, this issue came to my attention this summer when I had a number of folks in my area reach out to me about the availability of, of uh, liability insurance and then the uh, corresponding cost of liability insurance, where some of them are paying up to $35,000 for $100,000 worth of coverage. 
this uh, legislation basically changes Alabama law to move us from strict liability to proximate cause. It has been uh, worked on and, and is supported by a broad group of individuals to include the um, uh, restaurant and hospitality folks, uh, the retailers, um, and our friends at the uh, Association of Justice uh, have looked at this as well. And so we've worked out all of that. There are no amendments. There are no substitutes. And uh, I would like to uh, move for a favorable report. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. We have a first and a second. Uh, Senator Smitherman had a comment. Before you ask, make your comment, I want to tell you, um, thank you for your diligence over the past six, eight months <laughs> uh, in discussing this. I think it strikes a very fair balance between business interest and making sure that those individuals who might be um, have a catastrophic injury or death in terms of dram shop are still protected. So thank you for your diligence and work, Senator Smitham, and then we'll go to Senator Figures. Can you uh, give me an example of the two standards? I mean, of course, I understand what strict, you know what I mean? I understand the other, but I want to, if you, you weren't working on these many months, you could probably just got an analysis of what the new standard means. Okay, here's a person, I'm gonna, you pick up where I leave off. There's a person in there drinking, drunk, they see them drunk, see them drinking, keep feeding them old alcohol, they leave out of there. Under the old law, that's strict liability. You go out there and hit somebody and you just left there drinking and drunk, you, you know, you're dealing with that element. Now, we changing it. So now, under that same scenario I just gave, what's what's going? What takes place different than the fact that you know you're strictly liable because under those same circumstances? By the way, okay. Yes, sir. So this this bill would create a wider standard um, with the server having uh, to knowingly serve an invisibly intoxicated person, uh, and for that 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 service of that beverage to be the proximate cause of the injury or death. Uh, so a more specific uh, example may be um, if a person is uh, at a bar earlier in the day uh, and then uh, continues to, to go from establishment to establishment throughout the day, uh, you would have a higher standard that you would have to meet, again, not the strict liability anymore, uh, to tie the, the, the liability back to maybe the first establishment as opposed to the last the last one. So you'd have to you'd have to have an, an instance where the server knowingly served a visibly intoxicated person. Under that scenario then, who would be the defendants? I mean, you know, if 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 you got five folks that been to all five of them, you know, and under these new standards you know, and they drunk, you know, and and uh, who 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 would be you know, who would be the defenders in that case since strict liability is gone? Well, my, my experience, my experience as far as defendants go, now you, you're talking, we're talking about. Oh, you got five civil. places out, three, five, you know, sure. when you were saying, mm -hmm. okay. So we're, we're talking civil, so we're not, not defendants <laughs> necessarily, but, um, but you yes, would, well, yes, defendant. you're correct, you're correct. So my, my, the, the, uh, the standard here would be the folks that visibly served would be the ones or excuse me, that serve the visibly uh, intoxicated person would be the ones that would. And, and, it, okay, and it could be, it, let me make sure, it could be all five of those individuals could be. from the first bar to the fifth if that individual were visibly, visibly intoxicated at number one, two, three, four, or five. For the sake of these lawyers in here, I'm going to make this statement. Everybody else, too, but the lawyers. You, you keep saying, you know, I mean, nothing wrong with what you said now. Yes, sir. But you keep saying visually serve. That's, that's. That indicates to me that we're talking about the server and not the business. Are we saying that the business is going to be excluded from it and the actual individual who brings up the drinks as a server is, to, you know, it will be what the case would be built on, whether that server sit there and, and even though the, the, bi the business would still have liability as well. Oh, okay. All right. Senator Figures, okay. question or comment? I just wanted to say that I support this bill, and it has been worked out by all, by all parties. And my restaurants in, in Mobile met with me early on, uh, months ago, uh, about this bill. Thank you for your support. Mr. Chairman. Senator Coleman Massa. Do we need to be outlawing pub crawling? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just pub crawling. Yeah. You know, pub that. crawling. 
Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was until I had experienced it. But oh, I thought yeah. they called it bar hopping. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> I hadn't heard pub crawling. Better yet, the entertainment. Uh, this by the time you get to the second or third, you crawling. Yeah. <laughs> what impact, <laughs> Mr. Chairman? What That's impact true. is going to have on the entertainment districts? I mean, think about it. I mean, this this is what we're doing now. We're spreading it, saying that from this place, that the whole it really technically we opening it up the whole district. You they know, just can't now get drunk, versus Senator. versus trying to limit you trying to limit they have to drink at this place to, to cover them. Yeah. And in essence, what we're doing is the whole entertainment district can be subjectly liable. Sounds like a sounds like a an amendment to exclude class one. Uh, I mean, uh, class one municipalities. Then maybe, huh? Keep talking. <laughs> Keep talking. But we just extended hey, all hey, the hey, entertainment I, district. I, I, I hear what he's saying over there. But until further notice, we still won. You just got a few more folks. That's all that is. All right. Well, listen, it uh, sounds like uh, no other comments or questions that I see on the bill. Uh, there's been a first. Uh, I'll second that if it hadn't already received a second. Um, Holly, if you will, call the roll. Senator Albritton. Aye. Senator Bell. Aye. Senator Cornley. Aye. Senator Coleman-Madison. <laughs> Senator Elliott. Aye. Senator Figures. <laughs> Senator Gavan. I am laughing. <laughs> Senator Orr. Senator Singleton. I would reservation. <laughs> Senator Smitherman. I'm going to say, I, and I want to thank you for, you know, and I'm not throwing off on nobody, but this man hounded me and worked me and worked me and explained every question I had to ask for. We got to even this point to him putting it in. So I stopped I taking his calls. I, I want to commend him for that, not telling me I can come and you got the chance that you got something to say. He wanted to make sure, and I just give him credit in public where it's due, that you did a great job in, in doing that. And I vote for it. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Stutz, Senator Weaver, Senator Barfoot. Aye. Twelve. All right, Bill's giving favorable report. Um, so we've got three bills left. We've already gone over about 13 minutes. Uh, I understand Senator Van uh, would like to carry his bill over. Is that I'd correct? Like to carry all three over to Drew. Yeah. Well, we're yeah, going. We, well, well, if in the in the for the for the good of the committee, I'll carry mine over. Uh, those three bills, remaining bills, will be carried over. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, committee members. <laughs>